Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Amy Marjoram Berg, and I'm an executive vice president with the Aspen Institute. We're thrilled to have you today. Should be a great session with two very smart people. Um, Pulitzer Prize winner David Leonhardt is the editor of a very cool new website called The Upshot, which is um, part of the New York Times. And it's a, it's a new uh, deep dive and interactive way of getting the news. If you haven't tried it, um, I highly recommend it to all of you. And before that, he was a New York uh, Times Washington bureau chief and also worked for Business Week in the Washington Post. Larry Summers, as you know, is President Emeritus of Harvard University, where he still teaches. He was the National Economic Advisor to President Obama and United States Treasury Secretary um, from 1999 to 2001, and has held numerous other prestigious policy positions and posts. But I won't go into that because we want to hear from our two speakers. So welcome and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thank you, Larry, for doing this. Um, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna try to cover a lot of ground here today, um, uh, as Larry is able to do, uh, and translate economics for uh, for an audience of people who are mostly not economists, which would include me, even though I sometimes play one. Um, and uh, then we're gonna open up the discussion to all of you, and and um, we'll have some microphones uh, moving about. Um, the place where I really wanted to start is whether we're ever going to get out of what feels like this long funk. It's been 15 years now um, since the economy felt truly strong, I would argue. We had a recession at the turn of the century. We had a weak recovery. We had a mediocre expansion. My favorite statistic is in 2007, we were on pace for the slowest decade of economic growth um, before we had the financial crisis uh, since World War II. And then we had by far the slowest economic growth since World War II. Obviously, we then had the crisis, and we've had this disappointing recovery. You got a lot of attention for the speech you gave to the IMF on secular stagnation. Um, how worried are you that we're in something that isn't just temporary, but that something fundamentally has shifted, and we uh, should now expect that economic growth is going to be slower than we have experienced for most of our lives? It's almost certainly going to be slower, and some of it's probably OK. Uh, the labor force is going to grow less rapidly over the next 20 years than it has over the last uh, 20 years. That's just demography. And that's going to make the overall GDP growth be slower. For most of American history, each generation has been better educated than the previous generation, as measured by high school graduation rates or college graduation rates that tailwind is essentially over. And we're not going to get that tailwind for the next 20 years. So growth, even in the best case, uh, is going to be slower. But I think there is a different problem, which is what I've had in mind when I talked about secular stagnation, that is a serious issue and is only beginning to get the attention uh, that it should. And that's this. Uh, we've had a slow recovery for the last uh, half dozen years. You characterized the recovery before the 2008 crisis as very disappointing. That's a reasonable view, I think, but it can be debated. What's unquestionable is that it rested on a financially unsustainable foundation. That here it was, we had the mother of all housing booms. We had vast erosion of credit standards. We had very easy money. And we had bloated budget deficits. And all that got us was mediocrity. And before that, you had uh, a recession. And before that, you had uh, the internet bubble. What's going on there? I think a significant part of what's going on is that for a variety of reasons, the propensity to save in the economy is higher. More of the money's going to. Uh, the wealthy, maybe there's more uncertainty uh, than uh, there used to be. And the propensity to invest has declined. Think about a companies like Apple and Google. There was a time when the cutting edge company in the United States would be issuing equity, would be issuing debt, would be investing on a massive scale. Not today. Those companies are awash with cash. The Sony Corporation is worth $18 billion. It's got 
buildings, offices, factories, tens if not hundreds of thousands of employees. WhatsApp could fit all of its employees fairly comfortably into this pavilion, and it's got 50, all 55 of them, and it's worth $19 billion. Well, in a world where that's true, there's just going to be much less physical investment. So when you have a chronic, so you have a chronic excess of savings over investment. Now, what's supposed to fix that in a market economy? What's supposed to fix that is the interest rate's supposed to fall, and it's supposed to fall low enough that people save less and they invest more. Only one problem, the interest rate can't fall below zero because then everybody would hoard all of their currency. And even if it wasn't constrained by falling below zero, when you get very low interest rates, over time you get a substantial proclivity to financial bubbles. And so there's a challenge of assuring sufficient, growth, sufficient demand, sufficient investment demand relative to savings to drive the economy to full employment with financial stability. And that's not a challenge we've met successfully for the last 15 years. Even if you think we got to full employment in 2007, we did it in a financially unsustainable way. So what's the answer? There are three models as to what the answer is. One answer, which is the one we're tending to pursue as a country right now, is the ostrich strategy. Um, <laughs> hope it'll go away. It can't really be true. Economies naturally find their level. They naturally get to full employment. Uh, if things are slow now, it's because of the overhang of the financial crisis. It'll all be OK. It's a strategy. It's a strategy we've been on for a while. And Growth was negative 2.9% in the first quarter of this year, so it doesn't seem to be working splendidly. Second strategy, um, which is the other part of the other way of understanding the strategy we've been pursuing, is, well, if interest rates need to be zero, they need to be zero. If interest rates de facto need to be negative, we need to do things that will create that kind of effect through quantitative easing, a range of federal credit policies, and create enough liquidity to make it all work. We've created a lot of liquidity. I think we've had more growth than we would have if we had not created that liquidity. I think on balance, compared to doing nothing, creating that liquidity was probably the right thing to do. But it's pretty clear that it's encountering diminishing returns. And it's pretty clear that the side effects become more and more toxic in terms of financial instability. So a liquidity monetary policy centered strategy for meeting secular stagnation is, I think, problematic, David. The third strategy, and the one that I would strongly support, is a strategy of focusing on raising the demand for goods and services, particularly investment goods and services, at any given interest rate. So you can get more growth without needing to court more financial instability. What are elements of such a strategy? The first has to be returning to a reasonable level of national infrastructure uh, investment. Is there anyone in this room who's proud of Kennedy Airport? <laughs> I'll tell you something worse about Kennedy Airport than what you see. How many people in this room, when they go home to watch television, watch a TV with a vacuum tube? The air traffic control system in the United States of America is based on vacuum tube technology. Only sometimes the, the, it doesn't quite work with capacity, and so it's based on yellow stickums put on a bulletin board instead. That's about planes crashing into each other. That's about how much excess circling there needs to be. That's about how much fuel is needlessly burned. Air traffic control the airport, these are examples of infrastructure investment. If a time when we can borrow money for the long term in a currency we print ourselves way below 3% and when the construction unemployment rate is in double digits is not the time to rebuild our infrastructure, I don't know when that time will ever come. And that is about driving the economy forward. But it's not only...
You know, but that sounds like a left of center uh, kind of uh, thing. I travel a lot, so I think about things having to do with airports and so forth. Here's another fact. If you want to call my office at Harvard, and I dare say it would be true with respect to your office at the New York Times, on the road from Heathrow Airport in London into London, or Beijing Airport in China into Beijing, or Alma-Alti Airport in Kazakhstan into Alma-Alti, the connection is better and more reliable than if you want to make that same phone call driving from Logan Airport into Boston, Kennedy Airport into New York, or Dulles Airport into Washington. And that's got to do with a whole set of regulatory barriers and NIMBY problems that stop adequate private infrastructure investment. Whether it is telecommunications, whether it is maximizing the potential of our energy resources, we have huge problems of regulating glacially and promiscuously distributing the veto power that stop adequate levels of private investment from driving the economy forward. So that's a second way of producing more demand at a given level of the interest rate. Here's a third uh, one. Take our tax system. You can, please. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me indulge me for just a second um, in, uh, in an analogy. Uh, my wife is an English professor, so we think about libraries. Imagine you were running a library and you had a problem that there were a lot of overdue books. You could imagine that you would decide to have an amnesty where you told everybody if they brought back their books, they wouldn't have to pay a fine. That would be a reasonable thing to do. You could imagine saying that that was immoral and they have to pay their fines and saying there's never going to be an amnesty, so you better bring your books back fast because the fines are only accumulating. That would make sense. Here would be a really stupid thing to do. Put a sign on your library door saying, no amnesty now, but we're thinking about having one next month. <laughs> and doing that every month for five years. That would be really stupid. Now, why am I talking about this? There's $2 trillion in US corporate cash sitting abroad. What is the posture of American public policy? For the last five years, it has been we're having a debate, and we might have a corporate tax reform where you get a break if you bring it home, but we don't really know. So nobody brings, any, nobody brings any money home. The money doesn't get funneled back into the American economy. It gets reinvested abroad, and demand languishes. You can have a good argument whether there should be a break, whether there shouldn't be a break. You can have a good argument about what the right reform is, but the uncertain posture we're maintaining right now is the pessimal solution. There is no better strategy for keeping the cash abroad than the one we are pursuing. So a better tax system would drive the economy forward. My view is that the principal focus of public policy debate for the last four years has been misguided. We have been consumed by a debate about debt levels in 2030 and about what the future of the long-term budget deficit is. And there are important issues to be resolved there, to be sure. But here's a fact. The Congressional Budget Office, they're basically deficit hawks. They estimate that if we increased the growth rate of the American economy by two-tenths of 1%, it would eliminate the entire 75-year fiscal gap that they now see. Now, I ask you, which is a better strategy? having a war about entitlements, about taking away Social Security benefits from people when the maximum Social Security benefit that anyone in the country ever receives is $35,000 a year, having that war, or figuring out how to grow the economy two-tenths of a percent a year faster? And I think the answer to that question is pretty obvious. So an investment-driven, 
by the public sector and the private sector strategy to lift us out of secular stagnation is, it seems to me, David, uh, what we uh, very much require. Two questions about the deficit that makes me think of. One, you mentioned our obsession for four years now has been the deficit. Do you think the administration could have done anything to change that obsession? Or do you think that obsession has come about because it's pretty typical in the wake of a financial crisis and essentially we were gonna be there no matter what the administration did? Because obviously one of the critiques from the left, right, of the president is that he pivoted too soon to deficit focus. You know, at, at a time when I weighed uh, substantially more than I do today, um, I told uh, the president um, and everyone else in the administration multiple times that yes, it was possible that we could overstimulate the economy. And it was possible that I could lose so much weight that I became anorexic. <laughs> but that starting from where I was, that was not the pressing problem. <laughs> And that it was pretty clear, there was very little danger that I was gonna to lose too much weight, and there was very little danger that we were going to overdo fiscal stimulus. Yes, I think, I thought at the time that X, the various political uh, constraints, that a larger, longer program of fiscal expansion, coupled with a greater recognition that uh, that business confidence is the cheapest form of stimulus um, would accelerate uh, the expansion. And I think that judgment uh, is right. Yes, I think there was an overly rapid bipartisan pivot uh, to deficit reduction. And I think in part it came uh, and, you know, it's always a professor's bias to think, to think that problems have intellectual misunderstanding at their root. And so maybe I overdo this. But there's a line that's been said by almost every political leader at one point or other, and it's just wrong. They say it's really important at a time when households are tightening their belts or households are containing their spending the government do the same thing as well. And it's just wrong. And the reason it's just wrong is what economists call the fallacy of composition. What's true for one isn't always true for many. If any one of you in back stands up, you would be able to see a bit better uh, what was happening on this stage. If everybody in the room stands up, Nobody will see better, and everybody will be less comfortable. Similarly, if one person saves more, they will be able to accumulate wealth. But my spending is your income. And so if everyone saves more, there's less spending, and that means there's less income, and ultimately you end up with less wealth accumulation and less saving. So I think there has been a real failure to appreciate the relevant economics of a situation in, with zero interest rates in the liquidity trap like the one we are now. And that coupled with habitual frames of mind which drive towards deficit reduction has led to a very serious error of excessive focus on deficit reduction for the last few years that has done substantial damage. Something also has changed during those four years, which is our healthcare spending has slowed down quite sharply. Uh, if anyone here has read um, Zeke Emanuel or Peter Orzag or heard them here, you've heard a lot about this. My reading of it is that it began before the Affordable Care Act, but the Affordable Care Act seems to have put some things in place that have contributed to it. Um, is the slowdown in healthcare now substantial enough and serious enough that it should, on some fundamental basis, alter um, how often we uh, wisely murmur about our long-term fiscal problems? Do we have one that's nearly as serious as we thought five years ago? 
I didn't think five years ago we had one that was as serious as people, as people thought uh, five years ago because I had a sense then that there were staggering uncertainties in all of these numbers and that it was just very difficult to make plans uh, based on them. I'm not an expert on uh, healthcare costs, but I've tried to read, read the relevant studies uh, pretty carefully. I would say the following. Um, healthcare, healthcare spending now is perhaps 5%, something like that, uh, lower than one would have expected uh, a few years ago. I think it's very unlikely that that ground will be lost. So I think one should revise, so at a minimum, one should revise down one's estimate of the entire path by 5% relative to what we thought before. I think it is plausible uh, to think that the growth rate will continue to be lower than it has been in the past, but I'm less confident with respect to the growth rate than I am with respect to the level. And yes, I think that um, the forecasts on average, the right best guess is that we're gonna have to take further steps with respect to the long run fiscal situation. But there is enormous uncertainty. Here's a, if you look at the president's budget, the president's budget document gives a confidence interval for its deficit forecast. Just like when you read a public opinion, political poll, it says plus or minus 3%. The confidence interval for the five years from now budget deficit, 2019 budget deficit. So that's not 2030, that's not 2040, that's five years from now. The 90% confidence interval is 10.5% of GDP wide. Or to put that differently, it is two trillion. It is about 2.2 trillion dollars wide. And what's the point estimate? The 10 trillion is around what? Is around for five years from now, it's around about three percent of GDP. And it's so percent of GDP. Yeah, and okay. so it's so it's. If you ask, like, is it statistically significant that we will have a budget deficit? No. Again. It could, be, it could just as likely be worse than we now think as better. So we need to monitor this. There are things that we, uh, that we need to do. But right now, millions of 18 to 24-year-olds are being put on career paths that will put them well below where they otherwise would be 20 years from now because there is not demand in the economy. I mean, this is a, this is a uh, fact that's come out of recent economic research on what economists call hysteresis that's quite striking. If you look at high school graduates who started working in 1982 or college graduates who started working in 1982 versus ones who started working in 1979 or 1985, it's basically the same except that 1982 was a really bad recession year. They are hammered in terms of their job opportunities, in terms of their family formation, in terms of the incomes they're earning, 25 or 30 years later, by virtue of having come out in a slack period. That is what our obsession should be, not the prospect of borrowed money 20 years from now. Because just to draw one other connection, Remember I started when I talked about the secular stagnation, talking about how savings exceeded investment and that was gonna push interest rates down? You know, your mortgage is a much bigger problem when the interest rate is 7% than it is when the interest rate is 2%. And so the features of the economy that I described that suggest that we're headed into a low interest era both mean that the deficit forecasts, if I'm right, are probably too pessimistic relative to reality. And whatever deficit we have, it's much easier to roll over debt when the interest rate on federal borrowing is averaging 1.5% and the economy is growing at 2% than in the world we've been used to where the interest rate has been higher 
relative to uh, the growth rate. So for all those reasons, uh, I just think that uh, the right obsession for us is accelerating growth, and that means freeing up the barriers and doing it both in terms of public investment and in terms of private investment, and I didn't mention it before, also the promotion of exports. So I know you're not a politician, but you've spent a lot of time around politicians. Is there any hope that any of the kind of policies you're talking about here happen at any point in the foreseeable future? Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a politician. I guess I take some but limited solace in a couple things. Um, one, there's some tendency for the transition from inconceivable to inevitable can happen quite rapidly when the nature of the dynamic, political dynamic, uh, changes, when some particular idea catches fire, when the configuration of forces uh, changed. Uh, I remember in uh, the spring of 1995, um, Bill Clinton had to protest that he was relevant, even though he was president. That in the winter of 95, 96, the government was shut down with extraordinary bitterness. And six months later, in an election year, the country passed a minimum wage increase, passed uh, major legislation that provided for health, ins uh, for health insurance, uh, portability, and took a number of other major steps that nine months or a year before would have been inconceivable. So I think it's very difficult to know what the world will look like uh, nine or 10 months uh, from now. And so I don't preclude the possibility of positive surprise. I also think uh, the logic here, at least, uh, to my mind, is fairly compelling. You know, the program of increased private and public investment that I described, this is not a far left thing. This is not a far right uh, thing. The notion that it's like better to have highways without potholes than highways with, with potholes is not particularly a Republican or a Democratic uh, idea. Uh, the notion that it's good to have more oil come from the Dakotas and less oil come from uh, the Middle East is not a particularly partisan, uh, freighted uh, kind of uh, idea. So I guess I think the logic is uh, pretty strong. And I'm impressed by uh, the reading of American history that's basically uh, optimistic. Let me give you, let me give you um, three examples. Um, Roosevelt tried to pack the Supreme Court because he thought the system was hopelessly gridlocked. He failed, but over the next few years, significant legislation in a number of areas was passed. In 1963, the American Political Science Association and James McGregor Burns, who was a great historian, um, proclaimed that the system was deeply and systemically gridlocked. And they explained that the reason was that we didn't have appropriately partisan political parties. That the problem was that we had all these Southern Democrats who were really conservative and all these Liber Northern Republicans who were really liberal, Jacob Javits and such. And so there was no coherence to the parties and no discipline, so the electorate couldn't make a choice, and so nothing could move. Well, you know, 1964 and 1965 were the most productive period uh, that uh, there, in terms of legislation, certainly before the recent period, in 40 years. In 1979, the book that was at least as large as Piketty has been over the last few months was Lester Thoreau's book, The Zero Sum Society, explaining how we were all zero sum and we were completely gridlocked and nobody could do anything. 
it was the view of the Washington worthies of the moment that we needed to have a constitutional convention to redesign the Constitution so stuff could happen. Well, you know, two years later, you can like or not like what Ronald Reagan did, and I didn't like a great deal of it, but you couldn't argue that the country was gridlocked and couldn't do things. So I think that, you know, Patrick Henry said in 1791 that the spirit of the revolution had already been lost. And so I think that it is the history of the United States that we have these self-denying prophecies, these Jeremiads that our political system no longer works, and that they are an important part of the process of renewal. And so I guess I'm ultimately optimistic and ultimately think it's worth plugging away at what the right things are, not because you're going to move things instantly, but because the more at gatherings like this people come to views about what the right things are, the more when things open up, uh, those things are done. Actually, unless my memory is failing me, James Fallows has written a lovely piece maybe a decade ago on exactly that topic, on how our prophecies of doom are actually an important feature of, of American success. So a version of that, not for the political system, but for the economy, it, it, that comment reminds me of what you said about WhatsApp, which is forever people have been worried that technological progress and automation is going to put is going to create mass unemployment, right? And those worries have been wrong again and again and again. And yet, it feels a little glib to dismiss them now, that we do, it seems, have a lot of these new exciting companies that don't employ a lot of people, as you said. It does seem like we're in this moment in which technological progress is not helping as many people as it did in some past points. How do you think about that? And is there any worry that we're in some sort of odd neo-Luddite moment? You know, you said, and it's often said, David, that um, these fears have always been wrong uh, in the past. I'm a little less certain of that. Mm -hmm. When I was an undergraduate at MIT, there was great discussions of the implications of automation, which had taken place in the late 1960s, and automation was going to take away jobs. And there were all these non-economists and engineers who said that. And my economics professors, led by Bob Solow, basically all said that that was stupid, that of course, if there was more output, then there'd be more income. And if there was more income, there'd be more spending. And then the more spending would create the jobs, and it would all be OK. And so I was basically taught that the that the worried about automation people were stupid. And that's basically what I believed with a lot of conviction until two or three years ago. And then it occurred to me that what's happened over the last 20 years? Take a 25 to 54 year old men, and I choose that group, not because they're the most important group in the country, but they're the one where there's the strongest social expectation that more or less everybody will be working. In the 1960s, one out of 20 men between the ages of 25 and 54 were not working. When the economy fully recovers, if we fully recover, we have a cyclical expansion, and the overall unemployment rate is down to 5%, it will be about 15% of the 25 to 54 year olds who are not working. Three times as many. If you forecast it, it's on a fairly steady upwards trend. The fraction of 25 to 54 year old men working in the United States is less than the fraction of 25 to 54 year old men working in France. If you um, do the same comparison for uh, men without college degrees, the gap is that much greater. If you do it for African Americans, the gap is substantially greater in terms of the increase. So I would argue that this isn't some hypothetical possibility that could emerge in the future. What is before us is that this has happened. Here's one more way to say it. The number of people who are, number of men who are doing production work in manufacturing is now just about equal to the number of men who are on disability insurance. 
And that ratio was five to one in the 1960s. So this isn't some hypothetical future possibility. This is something that's emerging before us uh, right now. And we're going to have to deal with it as a society, just as we had to deal with. It is true that uh, the transition from an agricultural economy to an industrial and service economy happened, and eventually people found jobs, and jobs on the farm shrunk. That's true. It's also true that we still have tens of billions of dollars a year spent on farm programs, even today. It's also true that we invented the welfare state uh, in between. And so we are going to need to address this. How are we going to address this? Some combination of uh, things. Uh, education is uh, one, uh, is one uh, crucial uh, element of it, but it's probably not uh, fully, uh, surely not uh, fully sufficient. And even if it was, 80% of the people who will be in the labor force in the late 2020s are in the labor force today. So it works uh, with a very long uh, lag. Doing the kinds of things about infrastructure that I described and promotion of investment, those provide good jobs for people who are able to work with their hands and construction is an absolutely crucial sector in terms of opportunities for uh, the workers um, who, are, uh, who are probably uh, most, uh, most uh, challenged. We're going to have to think about the incentives we provide uh, employers um, to employ more people. Uh, to reduce the effective cost of hiring labor. The earned income tax credit is important in that regard, but there's much more, uh, I think, uh, that, uh, can be, uh, that can be done uh, in uh, that regard. We're going to have to think about uh, a quite surprising aspect of contemporary American life, which is that if you look at measures of migration and mobility, we think of everything as being much more dynamic today. If you look at the number of people who move more than 50 miles or who move between states, it is way down from where it was 20 or 25 years ago. That's got to do with a variety of lock-in things that are happening in the housing market um, as one important aspect. And I don't think we fully understand it. We're going to need to, have, we're going to, need to find ways to <laughs> make it much easier uh, for people uh, to uh, move to opportunity. And we have to recognize, and I think this is, a, this is what is going to be most difficult in our political process, that the nature of the changes in our economy is likely to force some expansion in the role of the public sector. Here's a, indulge me in one more piece of uh, data. They collect consumer price indices for all different products. They're all set, normalized, to be 100 in 1983. So 100 in 1983. The consumer price index for a television set is six. The consumer price index for a year of college education is 600. So the relative price of a year of college or a day in a hospital relative to a television set has changed by a factor of about 100. Well, who's more involved with things like healthcare and education? And who's more involved with things like television sets? The private sector with television sets. And the public sector with things like health and education. So if we want to have, and if you look at forecasts of where all the future jobs are going to come from, it's healthcare and education, very large part 
of future job creation over the next decade. And so these changes in relative productivity are going to have consequences if we want to employ everybody fully for the relative size of the public sector and the private sector. And we're probably just going to have to recognize that as a country and how we recognize that and how we put people to work. I mean, here's the thing to keep in mind. There may be, and this is the sort of economic problem we're describing, there may be issues of how much well-paying work there is to do for certain categories in our population for which there's a strong and viable business plan. But if you think about the number of kids who go home alone for hours and hours, think about the number of kids who don't have any opportunity to play Little League, if you think about the challenge of a rising aged population, there is plenty of valuable and important and crucial work to be done in our society. And there's plenty of people who need work. And we're going to have to confine the social arrangements that make that possible. I don't think, with great respect to the political leaders I've worked for and uh, others who I think have brought great imagination, great drive, great, ten great tenacity to responding to an evolving economy. I don't think the information age has yet found its Franklin or Teddy Roosevelt, its Bismarck, or its Gladstone in terms of crafting the kinds of institutions that we're going to need if there's going to be employment uh, for uh, everybody. The answer is surely not to try to stop technical change. But the answer is also not to just suppose that everything's going to be OK because the magic of the market will assure that that's true. Let me pick out one little bit of that, and then we'll open it up to questions. At the beginning, you talked about the idea that for the first time in a very long time, the next generation will not be more educated than the last generation, or will not be substantially more educated. There is nothing inevitable about that. I assume you would agree. We have not hit some ceiling of the human capital of our population or the educational attainment. What can we do with our education system to make it more productive, to, uh, to improve it, given its economic importance? Let me highlight three things. Um, one, uh, we need to make sure that there's full access to higher education. Somebody said it well when they said, um, dumb rich kids are more likely to go to college than the smartest poor kids. And that's a fact. And it shouldn't be that way in the United States. And I was really proud when I was president of Harvard to introduce the concept that uh, no one with an income under $60,000 had to pay anything to come to Harvard. And it got emulated by a dozen or so schools that were in a position uh, financially to do what Harvard uh, could do. But relative to the whole population, that is a drop in the bucket. And some of it will be reinventing education through technology. Some of it will be making more acceptable and finding formulas for income contingent loans that let there be borrowing. But we got to do better on equal opportunity. And then there are two other things. There's a whole set of things around measurement and so forth with education. But I want to highlight two more philosophical things that I think are the key to fixing American education. The first is you have to take a stand on this question. Do you think that mostly self-esteem comes from achievement? Or do you think that mostly achievement comes from self-esteem? And we run a system that's based on the premise 
that achievement comes from self-esteem. That's why the most common grade in the Ivy League is A. <laughs> That's why if you give math tests to eighth graders, American kids are way below average. But if you ask American eighth graders how good they are at math, We've got the most confident, we've got the best self-assessment of math ability in the world. And it's just a philosophical decision. And in all sorts of ways, our system is framed around the idea that if we just make people feel good, then they'll achieve. And we need to move it the other way. The other part of it is um, think about the, what's the difference between, at the most basic level, between communism and capitalism? most basic level is that in capitalism, the sellers are all trying to play up to the buyers. They're advertising, they're promoting, all the stores are trying to seduce you to enter them. Sellers trying to suck up to the buyers. In communism, you really want to be friends with your butcher because that's the only way you'll be able to get a cut of meat. And basically, the suppliers that the consumers are trying to play up to the producers. What's the American education system? The American education system is run for the convenience of the providers rather than being run for the benefit of the consumers. Whether it's, <laughs> whether it's tenured professors who teach 50 hours a year in leading universities, whether it's the inability to fire incompetence in public schools. You could give example after example. But on those, I think if we could get a social and broad consensus on those two points, that the system needs to be run for the benefit of the consumers, and the way it will be best run for them is if we recognize that challenge and achievement is the route to self-esteem rather than the other way around, I think that offers the best prospect for strengthening our educational outcomes. I knew it was worth taking a couple extra minutes for education. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we're gonna, we have a bunch of microphones circulating around. Um, let's start back there in the back. Um, and please keep questions brief. Thank you, Larry. Your 0.2% comment on how much the deficit we reduced by that growth reminds me the Republicans' mantra until recently was we can cut taxes because there'll be such a benefit to the economy that it won't cost us anything. And I guess now they're stuck on the deficit is you know to zero. How do we change that dynamic? Because that was their idea originally that gee we can you know get this way to prosperity. Look, uh, we've, ha we've had a really good test uh, recently. Um, we had a test which was that the state of Kansas basically did this plan. They basically said, we're going to cut taxes, and it's all going to make the economy work better, and everything will turn around. And it's actually more plausible that it would work for Kansas than it would for the country as a whole, because Kansas could hope to seduce business in from all the other states in a way that the country would only, to a smaller extent, be able to seduce the business in from the world. You look at the facts in Kansas, and it hasn't happened that way. So I think you just have to, you just have to look at evidence, and you just have to keep uh, pounding away um, at, uh, at the evidence. But I think it's uh, pretty clear uh, that therein uh, does, not lie, uh, does not lie the answer. We had someone right here in the front. Can you please comment on the, uh, what's your take on the student loan, the student debt? We're talking about trillion dollars. It's probably higher than the, the overall stimulus that was put into the economy. What's, what, what are your comments on the, how do we solve that problem? I mean, it's an important part of the society coming in and they start with this huge debt. So any thoughts on that? There's been a recent, um Brookings study that everyone concerned about this issue should either read the Brookings study or actually a more efficient way 
is to read what, the, what David in the upshot had to say, summarizing the Brookings uh, study. It is less ominous than I had supposed. More people are going to college. That's part of the reason debt has uh, gone up. Average debt levels have gone up significantly for college graduates. But the, if you look at the average uh, increase in debt, it's about two and a half years of the gain in the increment to income that comes from going to college. So the wherewithal to pay back that debt has actually increased very substantially as well. And I think this is an unfashionable view. Um, and this would not be popular politics. But I am always struck by the following. 25% um, of roughly of the relevant cohort will graduate from college. Half will go to college at all. It always makes, they will end up being the richer quarter and the richer half of the population. And so when people say that everybody should pay more taxes so that the people who are fortunate enough to get college degrees can have less debt burdens, I'm not sure that's actually such a great step towards fairness as much as people suppose. I'm very attracted to ideas uh, like the plan that's pursued in Australia where, um, in, where people borrow money and there's more of a presumption that young people finance their own education, but then finance it by paying a certain percentage of their incomes, um, perhaps up to some maximum, through some period of their lives. Now, there's a problem when you make, that when you make plans like that voluntary, which is that uh, the people who are planning to become investment bankers tend not to volunteer. And the people who are uh, planning not to work tend to be in a hurry to volunteer. And that makes it more complicated. So it's a very difficult thing to work through. But I would favor much more attention to income contingent lending and I would favor more caution in indiscriminate debt relief when it's going to go to people who are already relatively fortunate. Selectively. Ma'am, right there. I'll just add to that while the microphone's moving in. I think I would argue that to the extent that student debt is a problem, and I think it is to some extent, it's that second 25% that is getting debt and no degree that strikes me as more worrisome than the first 25%. Hi, this is Asha from Palo Alto, California. Uh, my question is related to, um, to the whole, you know, there's, a, there's pretty clear data now that says that most kids from all ages, from kindergarten to college level, don't learn in classroom settings. They learn much better in little peer groups in ad hoc, you know, cross subject areas and so on. And the results are, you know, are staggering as to how much, how much cheaper it is to learn in peer groups as opposed to in, in classroom settings. In California, at least, we are struggling with this day by day, trying to figure out you know, whether it's Khan Academy or whether it's Stanford. We are all trying, we're grappling with this whole idea of how do we restructure you know, college and school education. Is it, do you see any movement on the side of, you know, from, from government side to say we are recognizing this data? And if so, what, you know, what kind of policy instruments do you see shaping up? And I mean, is there, you know, is there likely to be some, at least some states that could be leading the charge on this? Look, this is, this is all in uh, enormous uh, flux. And anybody who speaks with certainty about it is a fool. Um, I uh, was very sobered by reading one of my predecessors as president of Harvard, President Pusey gave a speech about the potential of educational TV in 1958. And I promise if I read it to you, you would think that it was describing technology today. So I think one has to be cautious. I think the watchword, which we don't have today, is much more experimentation than we are prepared uh, to, than we have been uh, undertaking. We need to do a thousand um, 
careful randomized experiments with various technologies, various kinds of curriculum reform across uh, American public schools and find out what works and then we need to be able to move uh, to implement it. My guess is that the iPad is going to offer vast uh, capacity for improvement in educational outcomes and reduction in cost because it brings two things together that we normally don't associate. It brings scale. You can have your course or your class or your material or whatever it is and can reach 500,000 kids. And customization. Instead of everybody does the same arithmetic homework, if I get the first two addition problems right and the first two subtraction problems wrong, then I get a long, then the rest of my homework's about subtraction and vice versa for you. So technology should permit much more customization and much less, um, and also much more scale. Now here's the other thing though. You all are here. You all could be watching this in your living room. Your living room would be more comfortable. My guess is the food in your kitchen would be better, according to you, than the food at Aspen. But it's not the same, but it's not the same experience. People want a kind of collective experience in front of somebody. In front of somebody. So I think it's going to be very hard to know how it works out. But look. Um, the most basic thing about the education system, in some ways, is that vacation's in the summer. Why is that? It's because that was when the harvest was. That ceased to be relevant for the vast majority of people about 130 years ago, and yet it still defines the sector. And so I think education is fundamentally the least transformed sector of our economy. And my hope is that technology will make possible its massive disruption. Let's squeeze in. There was a hand way in the back there. We're running out of time, but let's get one more in. Thank you. Um, last week, two weeks ago, your predecessor, Paulson, and two other gentlemen, uh, Bloomberg and Steyer, came out with a report that painted the stark risks to the U.S. economy associated with climate change. Now, you are on record at some point expressing concern about the cost associated with addressing climate change uh, versus the certainty that people attach to the risks associated with climate change. In light of this new information, have you changed your view? I don't think so. In the following sense, um, I have believed that it was absolutely essential that the globe do things to contain uh, climate change. I've believed that for at least 25, at least 20 years. And I think the case is overwhelming and the case was further reinforced um, by the Paulson report. Now maybe it's because I'm an economist, but I don't think so. I also believe that it's essential to find the cheapest ways to do that and to achieve the benefits at lowest cost. Why do I think that? In part, just because it's better to conserve and save resources so they can be done for other things that people want. But in part, because I know that if we find less burdensome, less costly ways to, climate, to, do, to, to reduce climate change, we will do more of it than if we rely on more costly and more expensive and burdensome uh, ways uh, to do it. You know, it's really interesting. I, I, I've studied this a bit. Um, usually, when government estimates how much it's going to cost to do something, buy a new bomber, uh, launch a new health insurance, launch a new uh, health insurance uh, program, build a bridge, it's folk wisdom that the cost always ends up much more than the estimates, which is in part because the people are trying to get the project done, so they lowball. The environmental area is very interesting. If you look at 
when they uh, first put in anti-smog rules in Los Angeles after the Second World War, it actually cost about a quarter as much to comply as the estimates were at the time. When we put in the sulfur oxide regulations in 1990, the cost was about a fifth of what the estimates have been. You know, it's a little like when Roger Bannister ran the four-minute mile and showed that it was possible. You know, it had been a thousand years and nobody could run the four-minute mile, and then Roger Bannister ran the four-minute mile, and then in, within the next year, eight other people ran the four-minute mile. If we force things to be done, human ingenuity is to be bet on, and it's very likely to end up costing less than the prevailing estimates. So I think there is no danger starting from where the political process and the global system is now that we are going to overreact to the problem of climate change. I think the risks are all on the side of underreacting. But I think we will do this most effectively if we do it in ways that maximize harnessing market uh, forces of various kinds. And so I, for example, am much more enthusiastic, even though they're less politically popular, about uh, carbon taxes or measures that uh, regulate and tax the use of carbon than I am about government-run industrial policies in the name of uh, clean energy, which I think tend to reward the well-connected um, as much as they, and the people who can produce hot air, as much as, they, as much as they serve to reduce the heat of the air. Um, uh, but yes, absolutely, I think that report will perform a useful function in spurring things. I think the, you can argue about some of the details, but I think the broad impulse behind uh, the measures that the EPA took uh, a couple of weeks ago is uh, very much uh, the right one. And look, uh, maybe this is a final thought. There's an idea that conservatives are people who want to preserve and who do not want to accept radical change. What is the right perspective for a conservative to have on this issue? I would suggest that it is that they don't want the atmosphere to be different than it's been any time in the last million years. <laughs> and if you believe that the atmosphere shouldn't be any different than it's been in the last million years, then you think we have to do something about this problem. Just as if you believe that it's really important to preserve market forces, you probably don't want to take the income distribution to a place that it's never been without a major revolt. And so I think conservatives need to think hard about what really the logic of their conservative principles is. And that sometimes preserving what's good requires doing things you haven't done before to achieve uh, preservation. And certainly that's very true in the climate area. Thank you all. Thank you, Eric.